that he has seen in the, the what he has seen in india from his long stays in india and his you know the kind of juxtaposition of the of the what he had seen happen in the west how is that i mean he would often say a lot of that he can see happening here in india um, so i would leave uh, leave it at that and let chuck introduce a little bit about his this east meets west kind of a thing and then we can um introduce a little bit Ch chuck you can introduce a little bit about the whole concept that we are trying to do through this parenting unlocked uh, series which is a series of 12 these kind of episodes that we want to discuss primarily we want people who are logging in to to put their questions it is rare opportunity to be able to get uh, advice and guidance from someone as experienced as chuck mm, is in this matter and and uh, through our our conversations we would like to kind of bring different perspectives into this but 12 episodes across the next three months i don't know uh, how many of these would be on the wealth app platform so there's an independent platform in any case independent group that we have created which we will we will mention at the end or put links for that for those of you who are interested to continue your association in this journey of of exploring ways to be uh, to to unlock your potential of better parenting. Um, over to you, Chuck, so you can kind of take it from here and then we can circle back. Thank you, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, all, all you young parents out there and, and uh, people I've not yet met in India. Um, it's nice to see, that's nice to be here. Um, so I'm gonna just jump right in instead of kind of giving, I've been, I've been introduced or I've been introduced and, and and begin with the, the premise that Saurabh suggested, you know, how I see parenting in India versus parenting in America. And uh, because I, I think that the truth is, even what I saw, you know, in the time I was there, it's probably even shifted more than, than what I'm gonna describe. But what, what I saw um, among Indian parents is you come out of a strong, long culture you know, and a premise of how to parent, you know, your parents and your grandparents, you know, they all kind of had a pretty constant and consistent theme about parenting. It's pretty structured. It's pretty, there's a lot of formal in your education. It's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, the methods of education are pretty structured out of, out of maybe the 19th and 18th centuries and 20th centuries. And it's kind of had a lot of continuity. Well, fast forward, this is 2021, and all of that continuity, you know, what I saw in parents there was a sense of mainly confusion, you know, that the old ways uh, that they had been raised with were being challenged, being challenged by the, by the, um, the dynamics of the Western culture introduced, being introduced into India. Oh, by the way, if I speak too fast, somebody punch me and, and let me know, and I'll try to slow down. I know that my accent is hard to understand. Um, but so I saw that the, the India is a culture that's emerging both with this long tradition of, of heritage and accelerating impact from the West, leaving people, you know, I saw it especially in young adults. You know, I saw it particularly in young women saying, you know, I want to, we want more rights. We want more power as women. You know, we're challenging the status quo. And I saw it in parents, you know, as they thought about how to, you know, to raise their children that the old norms were no longer somehow as rock solid as they used to be. And yet what, what's next? What do you, how do you parent in a very dynamic world? And it particularly, as I look at it now from America, I'm gonna shift now from how I see what's going on in India to what's going on in America and globally. And as I look forward in the 21st century, this is going to be a very dynamic next 50 years, that things are gonna change in ways that none of us know how to imagine. And so, you know, and the, and the goal of parenting is to raise adults who can thrive in the circumstances that confront them. So how do we parent in this kind of this kind of very dynamic world that we're in? And especially how do we parent 
preparing our children for this very dynamic, very uncertain kind of world where, you know, not only artificial intelligence, but the global population is going to hit 10 billion pretty soon, where global warming is a very real and very threatening kind of reality. You know, how, how do we parent in this environment with a pandemic going on where your children now are most likely at home full time? You know, increasing the amount of stress that you feel as a parent, the amount of uncertainty that you feel as a parent. You know, you're, you've got a job, your spouse has a job perhaps, and you're left now, you know, that you can no longer outsource the education of your children to schools. So how do we parent in that environment? Well, so I will tell you the one thing that I believe maybe most fundamentally about parenting. And that is that the core of how we parent is a function of how mature, how psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, physically mature we are as individuals. That human beings are not constant. They're not like, one, one kind of level of awareness or maturity or wisdom at any stage in their life. We are dynamic people who grow and change. We have the capacity, we have the potential to grow and change over time. And what I have seen in parenting, that I've worked with a lot of families over the years when I was a practicing psychologist, and they would make many mistakes, you know, and technique and strategies and all this. But fundamentally, what the child was responding to and what was going on in the family came from that fundamental way that the parent looked at him or herself and acted out instinctively with their child. And so my job as a, with the, with the family and a child as a child psychologist generally was to unfreeze the parent to begin to open them up to really the rest of the, their own recognition of how to be a human being. You know, to let go of their rigid sort of emotional locked in this and to begin to feel and express and live in a greater sense of calm, peace, clarity, wisdom, happiness, love with their children on an ongoing basis. So one of the things I used to teach parenting classes, of course, in, in Manhattan Beach and locally, and people would always come in expecting me to teach techniques. You know, if this is happening, then do that. Well, I was never much for teaching those kind of techniques. I always focused on how do you, the parent, grow increasingly more mature, more deeply wise, so that you can interact with your child in, because the children, children, there's the thing about being a parent. It, it, you know, it's not something that, we, it is something that we do very instinctively, finally. We do it out of our gut. And what we're really like is what, because the children can push our buttons. We didn't even know those buttons existed. And there we go. Now you see who we are, you know, instinctively. And so the more we work on our own being, and our own clarity and our own sense of well-being, the better parent we are. So now translate this into how do I parent now with it? I have my children at home and I'm feeling a lot of stress, you know, and how do I parent with my children at home feeling a lot of stress as I look forward towards the 21st century and the challenges? And I, I want to stay for just a moment that you know, it's hard for me to know how, because it's been three years or so since I've spent any time in India. It's hard for me to know exactly how India is internalizing the, the vision of the world in the future uh, the, uh, that I'm seeing here in America. But I am seeing trouble coming down the road, that this is not going to be the status quo of everything's fine. Uh, I see real serious kinds of challenges to humanity that our children are going to live right in the middle of. And so how do I parent, given all of this, towards that? And my one real answer, and this is my answer for myself. I ask myself, how do I live? How, what, what's my role in this? And my role and my belief is I need to become incredibly, increasingly more deeply human, more fully human, 
more deeply wise, more deeply loving, more deeply clear, more deeply solid, to, to have impact on everybody that I interact with from a place of real clarity. Okay, so now I think about, okay, let imagine that you're 35 years old, 40 years old, you've got two children, you've got a job, you've got, a, you know, you're a busy family. How do you do that? I mean, who, you know, how do you add that to your plate? And I think the one thing that Surab and I have most, maybe most profoundly in common is that he and I for many, for, throughout our adult lives, essentially, have adopted a set of practices. Now they're very different practices. What Surab does daily and what I do daily are different. But we have over our, the span of our lives found that a daily practice of centering, of touching into ourselves, of just giving ourselves, even if it's just two minutes or five, because some days it is only two minutes, but of touching in, of, of seeking out our own inner wellspring of, of being, that that practice over time has matured us in ways that we both are grateful to have had happen in our life. Because let me tell you one more thing that's really important to me. My, so I'm 69 years old now. My children are grown. I have grandchildren. My job as a parent has not ended. I continue to parent my adult children who now are much more peer to peer. I'm, I'm much less, you know, when I was 38 and they were 12, it was very different. Now I'm, I'm 69 and they're 39, you know, so they're, they're fully adult also. But nonetheless, my job of being a mentor for them and to being somebody, because I've lived 30 or 35 years longer than they, I'm still in the, in the mode of trying to influence their life towards more wisdom, more beauty, more solidity, more success. That, and, and, but of course, I have to do it differently because they're, they're very powerful in their own right. So, but my job as a parent and that role has not, uh, I, I will be that, have that role with them forever. So, so this is my core kind of communication to parents is that your first job as a parent is to become increasingly, because we all know, we see ourselves, we act out with our kids and we go, ah, oh, no, I, you know, that's not right. That wasn't good. And yet you did it. You acted out of some kind of, you know, pattern that you don't know how to intervene with and how to stop. And you did something and you feel it. You know that it wasn't the, the right way to do it. You know that it created, it increased the tension, it increased the discord in the family and that it's on you, it's your responsibility. And so this is the area that I am aware of the most is that as we become aware of our own kind of missteps and mistakes and we all make them every one of us sir i've seen sir make them he's seen me make them we make them but as we become aware of it to expand our our vision and our trajectory and our mission to become more fully deeply human because that's where the answer lies the answer lies that me at 69 i'm a better parent now than i was when i was 30 but when I, and when I, was th when I was 40, I was a better parent when I was 30. And I've continually grown over the span of my life to become not just a better parent, but to become more fully true to myself, true to the deepest core of myself, which is ultimately spiritual in nature, which has as a part of it, this sense of radiance and this sense of love of life and this sense of joy. So that's, that's, that's who I am. That's kind of how I, I look at all of this. And with that, that sounds like about 15 minutes. Um, maybe I will turn it back to the audience. And uh, because I can't talk it much more except in generalities, you know, the real uh, so we can thing get happens. We, we can, we yeah, can get some real questions. And the whole goal for this, this series is to actually uh, get real issues from people. And that's what when I first broached this subject, which Shakti had mentioned, that what, we would, what would be really useful would be to address real issues that people are facing. So I will just summarize quickly uh, what Chuck said, just in case the accent, some of the accent didn't um, go through to everyone. I'm sure most of the people would not have any problem at all. But some of the, some of the things that he mentioned, uh, 
hovered around the sense of responsibility. I think what Chuck is saying is that ultimately it's parents, it's our responsibility to to improve our own selves and continually improve our own selves instead of thinking that we have to do something to the children, uh, to our children. You know, that's that's the primary um, realization that both Chuck and I have had over the ages. And uh, the only other addition I would make is onto the, the issue of daily practice that Chuck talked about. It's a practice which needs to be part of the family and that's somehow not, uh, somehow got missing. I call it the practice for the operating system. You know, most of the education that is happening in this country is around the, the uh, academics or the stuff that we need to do in order to shine in the professional world. And most of the education and most of the push that parents provide or society provides is around that. Now, if I just use the analogy of the operating system and apps running on an operating system. So in that same way, what I would say is that what religion used to do at once upon a time or anything to do with morality or ethics would do once upon a time uh, would work on the operating system on which the apps of a, of a cricketer or an engineer or a doctor or an accountant or a lawyer, whatever profession we would we would ultimately shine in, uh, that profession would run on an operating system just like all the apps run on the Android operating system. Now, I don't see much, much practice or sanskar, as they say in our country, you know, discipline or daily routine or kind of focus on sharpening the operating system, keeping the operating system completely well-maintained, well-oiled. There are no practices for that. The whole day the child may be pushed to practice math or physics or any, any other subject, whatever be the subject. But the practices related to the operating system for, for living life itself must be inculcated one way or the other. And as Chuck said, uh, it may be different for each one. We don't, don't have a specific prescription, but unless this is the one realization Or we lost you. Yeah, yeah, I think we lost him. So maybe, uh, uh, you know, we can get some questions if somebody has or some thoughts on that, Chuck. Yeah. So, uh, so we have a question, uh, Chuck, from Mr. Abhijit Sengupta. Sir, coming back to India, it is, is it not parenting in India is very diversified and different from one region to the other? Like parenting in northeast part of India is quite different from southern part or northern part of India. I would assume so. I mean, the, the country is a very diverse, you know, group of sort of subcultures. You know, every every place I would go, they would say, oh, don't you notice, you know, for example, our food is so much different from over there, you know, and, and our traditions and our culture, our language, all of that is very different. My question back to you is, and therefore, what does that mean to you? If it's different? Now let this, let him respond. Mute, uh, the participants now. Obhijita can, yeah, Obhijita is unmuted. Yeah. Yes, uh, good evening, everybody. Hi, good evening. Yeah, what I wanted to mean that uh, if you look at it, India, and if you, you travel across the India, you will find the different cultures, as you rightly mentioned, yes. uh, and uh, different ways of life, different food, different language, different uh, mm -hmm. culture. Um, if you look at the northeast of India, the parenting is something like much open. They give much more, uh, much more liberty to the to the children to grow mm -hmm. up, to do the hard work. Uh, they don't keep them in the house like in the other parts of India. We take too much care of the of the children too much yeah, care, yeah, yeah. too much concern about their food concern about their education and all yeah. now if you see the results today northeast is coming up very fast even today if we see the last olympics we'll find the many people from the northeast has done so well comparing to mm -hmm. other parts of, of of india 
the sports has become so popular there because they are being despite it is being a very very i would say deprived uh, uh, deprived part of india for various reason mm. political or economical whatever reason may be if you look at the society the parenting is quite different in northeast of india which is a large yeah. large part of india seven states many people may might not have traveled there might not have seen there but it is quite different now if we come down to the south or north or even in the east we find that our parents are very conscious parents are very 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 much concerned about the children every time which sometimes works negative which works other way around to rather giving a good development to the children it hinders the children to go out for for work go out for some some good uh, venture that is what i wanted to mean so it is not in india it is not a standard practice everywhere yeah it, it, here's what i i i observe even sort of slightly different but in the same theme uh, i stayed often in a in a little sort of a, what we would call in America, a suburb of Calcutta, Moispatan, a small village that was notorious at one point for the corruption in the village. Uh, we had our ashram there. And I would see, there were many uh, poor children in, the, in that village. And I would see them every day outside on the field near where we were, playing football, playing cricket, you know, with all of them, you know, a hundred kids outside playing. All the upper middle class children that I knew were all inside studying, taking a lesson in this or that. And I always thought that the, the wealthier children were missing out, that they should be on the soccer pitch with the, with the kids playing as well. So yes, I'm sure, you know, yes, there are many different kinds of parenting approaches and philosophies throughout India. And from family to family, what you'll notice is that there's probably also, you know, more consistent within one culture, but still much variation. The question, the reason I ask you what was on your mind with that is that my personal thought is that every one of us has an innate instinct about who they're trying to become, that, you know, what they aspire to. And this is not just as a parent, but as a person. And that the more able we are to realize that aspiration, our deepest vision of who we are, the better parents we become. Absolutely. Because here's the, here's the ironic thing. The ironic thing is there was a study once that, that concluded that parents, if a parent felt like they were parenting consistently within their culture, then the outcome of their, their, their children's lives tended to be pretty uh, solid. However, if there was uncertainty in their culture as to what was right to do, or if the parents felt like they were not in sync with their culture, the outcome for their children was less, less solid. Well, here we are in a time where there is, you know, not only in India across regions is there differences, but in the, my perception is in the 21st century, there is a lot of uncertainty as to how to parent. This is the thing I think we're looking for is you know, our own, because we're confused. I mean, parents are, I mean, I just spent, you know, a couple of weeks with my son and my grandsons, you know, and deeply wise parents, they're confused as to how to parent. This is not, this, there's a lot of uncertainty and to which I think is very meaningful for us that we, we have to look to our own expansion of our own wisdom to learn how to parent, whether we're in the South of India or in the Northeast of India, I think everybody is facing similar kinds of issues. Yeah, Chuck, At least that's how an, I see it. We have another question. We have, uh, sure. uh, what is your opinion on the concept of tiger moms? Do they really produce so-called successful kids? Uh, and there's also well, so, another, yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah, that one, yeah. What, what define tiger moms might be a local, what does that mean? And, and you know, to translate that for me in terms of, is this like an over-involved mother? Is yes, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, let me tell you, they are everywhere. <laughs> my, my wife is now retired, but she was a teacher in, in Manhattan Beach in the middle school, which is 12, 13, 14 year old kids for 52 years. And tiger moms were the, the, the dilemma that she dealt with more than any other thing, the over-involved, over-concerned, overwrought, often aggressive mothers who, who 
protected their children and shielded their children from life and, and you know, helped them, you know, excessively. They, they, we call them helicopter moms. They hover all around them uh, in America. And they're not helpful. This is, and, and here, so here's the premise that I have. If you got, if that mom came into my office because her child was acting out in, in school in some way that was inappropriate, after I gained her trust, she would tell me she knew she was over-involved. She just didn't know how to handle how nervous she was, how concerned, how out of control she felt over her child's future. She wanted to feel like she had leverage so that she could help her child mature. She, but she doesn't know how to handle the uncertainty that she feels. Being, I mean, we're out of control of our children. We are, even if we're a great parent. The, the wisest parent I know was, was a, a guy that worked with Surabhanaya who lives in uh, Kerala. He was totally out of control of his children, except he trusted it. He trusted the whole process and it didn't scare him. And so he was able always to connect to them from a very mature, very wise place with his children who, who have grown up to be incredibly beautiful human beings. So this is the dilemma of the, the tiger moms is they're out, they feel out of control and it scares them. And so they're trying to, you know, I mean, think, you know, when I describe the 21st century, I mean, we are going to be out of control. Whereas we face these really difficult kinds of things, we are, you know, humanity is out of control. How do we respond to that? You know, we can't just micromanage our children into submission. We, it doesn't work. We have to learn how to trust that a pro, something that is more fundamental than our own, you know, intensity as we work with our children, as we live with our children, as we parent. So yes, we, but we have them here. We have them here in spades. Every upper middle class, well-educated community has many of them. Very bright parents with a lot of time on their hand and they are, they're tough. <laughs> Chuck, there's another question around digital addiction. Uh, ah. Children clinging to gadgets and parents don't have time to monitor. Any techniques on how to get rid of this addiction? Maybe both you and Saurabh can share your thoughts. Yeah. Oh man, that is a tough one. That, so I will tell you what my son is doing with his now six and eight year old boys. He limits very uh, rigidly how much time the boys can access the various apps, you know, and TV and media. And they don't do not have a television in their house. They have one laptop uh, that the boys can share and they get about two hours a week on it. So he absolutely, you know, at an early age, has established a rule in their family that limits their access to media, not just, not just uh, digital media, but media. So the boys are left with the challenge of creating something to do. And this is, this is the, the um, dilemma for parents. If you really do, now if your kids are 14 or 15 and they've grown up with this, that's a harder thing to do than if they're six or eight you know, to establish. But if you limit your child's access to media early, then your kids are going to be more challenging to you because they're going to want direction. You know, we use the, the digital media as a sort of a, a surrogate so that we can do our work. But um, uh, uh, so you, you be careful what you ask for because it means you're going to spend more time with them doing arts and crafts. And, and I think that back to my story in, in Moish Patan, you know, the one thing, the tragedy I saw in India, the biggest tragedy I saw, I'd be in housing complexes with the hundreds of children that lived there and none of them were outside playing, none of them. They were all in their individual cubby holes. The more you can get them outside playing and, and with their peers, the, uh, the better. So but it's tough, I, you know, it's tough. Well, one, one of the things that uh, happened early on, and I 
like you said, it is that we talk about gadgets now mostly because of the smartphone, which is so ubiquitous that it is <laughs> all the time out there. But then gadgets have been around always. And when uh, our children were, were in school, the re- one of the primary reasons I took the firm decision, a uh, strong decision to take them off school was repeatedly in every parent-teacher meeting, we would we would be we would be uh, lectured on how to ration television time. No, because because at that point it was not so much the smartphone. This was almost uh, 18, uh, 18 years back or so, 16, 17 years back. But it was television, and the whole parent-teacher meeting would be on how you would rash, you should ration television time. Now, the one thing that I had noticed was when Piku, our son, would be watching television, he was in a trance. This was early on, when it was really, uh, uh, I mean, and this happens with everyone, especially if you know, you know what Cartoon Network and all that is something that puts them on trance. And I would, I would prevent everyone from distracting them from that. While everyone would try to wean them away from that, this was one thing that I saw at that age itself was almost helping him develop meditative concentration. But I was not putting him in front of television in order to free myself. Now, there's a difference. I would be very, very careful and keep a watchful eye and just observe how the television would be an agent for him to develop meditative concentration. And if that was not not happening, so that was the purpose for television. So I think there are two things I would say. One is we have to be very, very cognizant with all our, our abilities of maturity and all of that to see how they use uh, the gadgets. The gadgets are gadgets. We cannot wean them away. Today, if we ration yeah. them, tomorrow they will get to it and it will happen. It's a habit of getting them into that, that wisdom as early on as to how they should be, what would be the best use of the gadgets. That's number one. Uh, because in any case, you know, books and papers are also gadgets. Once upon a time, a book would have been considered a gadget, considered to the time when there were no books. Now, because a smartphone has come in and we see that as a gadget, well, I have some questions around that. The other point is, uh, is a term that we always use throughout uh, the time that we were, you know, trying to, trying to, and I keep always saying, trying to raise our children, is um, the term, give them a better option. So yes. when yes. do we raise, when, when do we ration or limit? How are we doing it? Is it just a matter of a discipline or are we giving them a different option so that they can... Now that takes your own creativity. You have to give, you know, you cannot keep them to the gadgets and and be on to something else on your own, onto your gadgets. If that that gadget could be your bottle, it could be, uh, you know, your whatever else. It need not be a smartphone for you, but you have your own gadgets. So instead you have to find, and it's not always that you have to give them your time, but you have to design time stuff yeah. which are better options than what they can do with the gadgets and that that's that's absolutely right sir but that the, 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 if you look at your own motive and your own kind of sense of things around gadgets and and uh, if the parent you know is able and willing to undertake the deeper responsibility providing them a richer environment so that they're in balance much more so than they used to be you know, or they otherwise would be, then that's really the, the answer in my mind. However, I will say this. I know that uh, digital media has pernicious kind of influence on children that, uh, you know, is, is not healthy for them. A- and to, to that, you know, and so there is really a saturation point that's not healthy for them. You know, it's not, it is not just that they get into a meditative state from watching television, but their digital media also amplifies sort of their sense of stress and anxiety, you know, and the kind of games they play in a lot of unhealthy kinds of ways. So the, the richer, I mean, that's what, that was my metaphor about the kids in Moist Bataan. They were outside on the soccer pitch playing. That's, you know, that, that's, that's really, I mean, if I were gonna say the one, the deepest flaw I saw in, in Indian uh, culture with children was they weren't outside playing. 
They just weren't. They're inside all the time. I mean, there's, you know, a billion three of you. And the only ones outside playing are the poor kids, which is just heartbreaking <laughs> to me. It's a nice point, Chuck. Chuck, another, uh, Mr. D.P. Roy. So there are two questions. Uh, one is, what should be the ideal age for slowly initiating the sex education? And secondly, D.P. Roy of ITC says, kindly share five specific pointed messages towards effective parenting. He, it's like a like a consulting. He wants you to put on your consulting hat and do five <laughs> specific messages. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with that one. Uh, well, I'll start with the sex ed, the sex training, the 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 training about life and and sex and love begins right at the outset. You are training them with your spouse already, you know, so that the more you and your spouse have a respectful, open, you know, healthy communication. I mean, the, the, so I'm going to back up two steps. When I work with children, uh, what I would, my dissertation was on doing individual psychotherapy with children, which was fabulous. And that occasionally was what I needed. But generally I recognized, oh no, it's in the family. They're responding to what's going on in the family. Then I would meet the parents and I'd go, oh, it's in the, the, the parenting relationship. It's not, it's not fun. It's not loving. It's not healthy. This is where the, the problem stems from. So the first thing is to look at your relationship with your spouse so that it becomes a fully, you know, as healthy and as loving and as warm as it can be. That's the context that you, I mean, that's what they're going to first of all see about about what goes on between, uh, you know, men and women. And then, at, at, you know, slowly, at, you know, as you, as you feel comfortable, it's no, you know, as you feel comfortable in the ways that you feel comfortable, you expand the, the understanding. But it's better if you can at least, you know, they're going to learn about it in school. That's where I learned about sex it was, you know, on the playground with, from my buddies as we guessed around. And at some point around that time, my dad, he got a little drunk to tell me because it scared him, but he sat down and sort of gave me his version of it. Uh, the timing for that was about right. You know, I probably could have done it without getting drunk, but that's okay. You know, but so, so that as they, you know, you want to kind of lockstep with your own memory and answer your question for yourself. When would you like to have learned? And how would you have liked to have learned? That's probably a good place to start from. Okay, five bullet points. Uh, go back to what Surab said in his summary for me. You are responsible for your own being. That who, it's not a technique, but who you are and who you and your spouse are, that is the single most impactful parenting influence that you have. The, be responsible for your own inner conflict and your own understanding of your weaknesses and, and take steps to solve them. Number two, recognize that your child isn't doing it on purpose unless he's learned to. That your, you know, your child con concerns you, they have this certain kind of character and your job is to communicate to them as they are because that's just who they are. We sort of think we're supposed to shape our children into some vision, and yet they're different from them. So learning to communicate to them as they are is the second point. The third is learn to handle conflict and tension. Because my job is to, you know, one of the, the videos that Sarab and I did already, my job is to provide them an adult perspective, an adult judgment, while they don't have any. I'm gonna be their surrogate adult. And I need to impose my will upon them quite often. I need to exercise judgment. Do that without being either passive and kind of getting uh, uh, angry when, and frustrated when it doesn't work or being too uh, 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 angry and aggressive with them so that they're uh, defeated by it. Learn to parent from a place of neutrality where my judgment works and yet you have the right to be a kid. That's three. Number four, recognize your own uncertainty about parenting. That we all feel uncertain 
and coming to terms with that because the answer isn't like clear. You cannot, there's no book that you can read. If you simply recognize your own uncertainty and, and begin to talk about it and think about it, you'll do a better job. And fourth is have some fun, enjoy your child, make sure that there is, you find a way to laugh, to play uh, together, that, that there's intimacy, uh, that they connect with you, you connect with them and feel you know, good about it. There's five. <laughs> Then uh, Payal, pa pa Payal had a uh, very important question. I mean, I think. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah. So, one, so, so Payal had a uh, important question, which is, uh, uh, how do uh, how do you manage uh, uh, anger issues with teenagers? How do we manage anger issues? Who's angry, the parent or the kid or both? <laughs> hey, that's an important question. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, but I'm gonna assume, I, I'm gonna assume from this and I might be wrong. I mean, that's a legitimate question. I'm going to assume that the teen, you have an angry teenager. Yes. Yeah. You know, so, and so often when I saw angry teenagers, what I found was that the parents throughout, this is not new exactly, that the anger over the span of the childhood has worked as a strategy to manipulate the parents. So, so the question is, you know, uh, uh, what's the goal of the anger, you know, and how effective is it? And, and, and because anger does one of two things with a parent, you know, with, when a kid is always angry, it does one of two things. It either gets the parent to submit to, to say, okay, fine, do what you want. I don't have the energy or to get angry back and to punish them or to escalate the battle. And both of these ironically are rewarding that a kid, when a kid can make you angry there, they get a certain kind of perverse satisfaction. So, so the trick is, the trick is to not fight the anger. You know, that you, the term in psychology is extinguish. You want to extinguish something. And the best way to extinguish something is to not feed it either positively or negatively, which means to do something like say, I know you're angry and I'm not going to get angry with you back for being angry. And it won't work for me. You won't manipulate me with it. Now let's try to have a conversation about what's really going on. And that's, you know, now some, and that's really the goal is to have the conversation about what's really important in the whole dis discourse. But you have to do that by not having the anger be the focus of the, of the conversation. Also understand that adolescents, because they're, what they're doing in their developmental journey is they are beginning to establish autonomy from you. They're separating from you. And a little bit of anger with you is normal. That they're going, they're just, you're just a drag to them and, and they're upset about a hundred million things. And there's nothing, I mean, that's a normal part of adolescent evolution that isn't really necessarily a problem. But how you handle it makes it, you know, makes it better or worse. And often, and what I think, often the angriest kids were those who have had a long term success of kind of being able to manipulate with their anger uh, with the parents. The parents didn't know how to handle how, in, how willful they were or how smart they were. They, they overmatched their parents emotionally. And that's where it gets really hard. Thanks, response, Chuck. Yeah, yeah. Chuck, response uh, to an angry teenager that you mentioned, which is the, the uh, telling them that you well, you are angry, you have the right to be angry, but you're not going to be able to manipulate me and I'm not going to become angry in return. This response takes a certain level of daily practice on the part of the person. <laughs> and daily Absolutely. practice is not on handling anger, but daily yeah. practice on the operating system. And that's yeah, yeah. the point. You, it's not a response that you can memorize and then, you know, we, we, it out. You can you, you can mimic it, 
You know, you can fake it till you make it. You know, there's a saying in America, you can fake it till you make it. And even faking it, because it's that focuses your trajectory and your intention, you know, and then you work on it because undoing that anger. I mean, so what I experienced sort of with this is I may also feel even at 69, I may feel angry still. I just learned how not to feed that anger. You know, it may exist, it exists on its own level, but I'm, I'm free now not to act out of it as much as I used to be. And that's the result of the practice. How to, how to witness my emotions as they happen. So I must also share something with everyone, which is something that I really learned deeply from Chuck, is this whole uh, integrity about your own self and being able to confess that the, each of us, I mean, he would constantly confess that he had a long way to go. I mean, he was this white man expert out there, done this, been there, done that, all that with us. And he would constantly give us the feel that he had a long way to go. And that's something that we would learn from him, all of us. Me, my family, our children would learn from him that we all always have a long way to go. I still do. <laughs> uh, you know, we're into the last five minutes. I, you know, sir, one quick uh, question is, you know, you've done a, uh, you've done a lot of research on peak performance, you know, uh, and uh, what, what people always think of is how to get their children or to, to the top of the class or achieve peak performance. I know that's a full uh, webinar by itself, but it'll be good if you could give some uh, you know, small insights since you have been relentlessly pursuing that path. Well, because every I mean, time is short and everyone wants bullet points, just three points. <laughs> we, we start and end every session with that. It's part of our ashram's seva mantra, which we, which we use. And it ends with three words, pragya, kaushal, and sadhana. And it kind of, these are missing in most of the education system, the education system kind of, and this is pragya, kaushal and sadhana about two things, about the operating system, as I said, and the app on which, so if you want to be a great tabla player, you have to do both of these at two levels. One is the operating system level, which is, which earlier at once upon a time used to be provided by your religion. You would go to the church or they would go to the temple or I don't know what the whole, uh, you know, there would be a cultural milieu that has kind of gone missing. So the operating system of pragya, kaushal and sadhana, which loosely would translate to wisdom, techniques and deep committed practice. You need to have that at an operating system level for your life. And then whatever you want to excel in, whether it's it be uh, drumming or guitar or music or dancing or computer programming or accounting or nanotechnology, whatever it is, the same thing on that. Pragya, Kaushal and Sadhana on that particular field. So this is the shortest answer that I have. Uh, and that, that... I, want, I just want to amp... let, yeah. Ron, let me just amplify. So I'm a big golf fan. I, I love golf. I watch professional golfers. And we just had a, a the year ending tournament in America. A, and the, the man that won it, the young man that won it, he, he talked about, and he just performed magnificently under pressure. Oh my goodness. It was just breathtaking how he performed. And he said, my goal when I play golf is I want to stay in a trance state the whole time around the golf course which is mind blowing. Now he has, so this is his core practice. His core practice is this deep wisdom. He has obviously practiced the technique along the way, you know, to get, get to the point where he can trust it enough. But his whole orientation to performance was to not get involved in the outcome, to not get involved in the, the, the strain of, of, of performing, but to stay in a moment, to stay in a place of trust and clarity so that he can allow his own innate capacity to flourish, which is the which is what Surab just described in, in his his mantra. But it was amazing to see, amazing to see how this man performed, this young man performed under the most extreme pressure. You know, yeah, uh, you will love, yes. you will love to uh, you will love to uh, have some conversation with this 
person, Keith Witt, if you're not already kind of connected with him, he's part of the integral uh, movement also. Keith Witt is is a kind of, a, you know, peak performance. He has a lot of stuff to say about, about that. So one awesome. of the things he mentions is uh, for tennis players, for example, he came up with a very, very specific technique, which is so close to witnessing meditation in tennis earlier. Tennis coaches would say that you have to watch the ball, you know, watch the ball. But then now it has all changed to you have to watch yourself and not yes. the ball. Right, right. You know, find that find that person who is watching who's watching the ball. So there and and he's kind of designed practices around. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. I mean that's the whole. I mean we're we're way upstream, but that's the whole practice is who's watching my life, <laughs> who's at the source of me. And that, and that's where the real joy is. Yeah. Is the more I recognize that identity, that's where the heart opens, the mind opens, and life flows. Yeah, and you know, on that, uh, I mean, I think we've reached. But Chuck, I think one of the most important things I've learned from you as a father of fifteen and thirteen-year-old girls, and I really miss you, Chuck, being in India. You know, I really miss it. Uh, you know, uh, is the fact that you focus on yourself. You know, post-COVID parenting is also focusing on yourself. Uh, and, and and apart from those five things that you said, and you you become a better person, you have a better relationship with your wife. Then parenting by itself will be more thing. I, I would like to end this. Uh, I mean, obviously, this will be a series of conversations between Dr. Chuck Schreiner and Sri Saurabh Sarkar. I mean, it's great that we almost had 66 people from the. We had 80 wow. guys, and you know, and until the end, we kept in the Zoom days. It's you know, a 15% drop off is nothing. You know, people you people are we look at 50% drop off rates. So I, I'm really happy that you know people stuck on. So. I would have Shamajit, the founder of, uh, and really, uh, they really made this all happen because Chuck and Saurav keep talking and they've really not gone out. This is the first public conversation that Chuck and Saurav with all their wisdom have had. And really, I thank Shamajit to make this happen. Uh, and Shamajit, maybe you want to do a word of thanks and we wrap it up. Yeah. yeah thank you very much, Ram. Chuck, Saurav, and thank you more. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I really love to uh, express my gratitude to everyone who could take this time out and join today. Uh, so please, uh, for your information, we have a Facebook page, which is Parenting Unlocked. So go there, join the group, listen to Chuck and Saurav more. And uh, whatever little I have seen Saurav, uh, he is all, uh, always there for any uh, personal advice as well. So he is very much in Calcutta, uh, and uh, please uh, reach out to uh, me or my team members. Uh, Saurav is like family to us, and uh, you can always uh, meet him and uh, spend some time with him. In fact, just taking your kid to the ashram that Saurav is uh, nurtured uh, for uh, literally over the last uh, few, uh, few years uh, is something to witness and learn from. Uh, so. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, all gratitude and all thank you. Hello. Summit, sit there. I'm going to go. Bye, everybody. <laughs>